Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville, This is Faith. I sat down with Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan. You don't wanna miss his episode. There is always someone around you in need of encouragement, your smile and your words of hope. You know him as Lieutenant Dan in the movie Forrest Gump, Gary Sinise. His stage, film, and television career has spanned more than four decades earning him numerous awards and nominations like the Emmys, Golden Globes, Oscars, and many more. And you can find his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In the midst of his career, Gary has stood as an advocate on behalf of America's service members, earning awards to name a few, the Bob Hope Award, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society's Patriot Award, and the Presidential Citizens Medal. But it hasn't always been easy for him, facing trials and heartbreak. Today, he shares his passion through the Gary Sinise Foundation, changing the lives of our veterans. This is his story. This is today's Nashville. This is faith. Gary Sinise, you are so loved around the world for your movies, your character, Lieutenant Dan, and what you do for our veterans. Thank you so much for inviting me to the Gary Sinise Foundation. I am so honored and blessed to sit down with you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. You have Wait. been so busy. I read your best-selling book, and I want my friends to know everything about you. Let's start from the very beginning. You grew up in Chicago? Uh, yeah, yeah, born on the south side of Chicago. And I, I read that actually your name is pronounced, your grandfather changed his name, yeah. you're Italian, yeah. and changed it from, how, how would you say it in Italian? Sinisi. Sinisi. Yeah, so when, uh, when he came, uh, his, his, his father, my, great-grandfather came through Ellis Island and the story goes that uh, they looked at the at the spelling and uh, the, when they were checking him in through Ellis Island and uh, they said your name's Sinise that's how we're gonna say it and so they they made they just flattened it out and that's what that's what stuck and he wanted to be an American so he said okay Sinise is it and so you came to Chicago like there were nine kids, and uh, five of them were born in Italy. And then uh, great-grandfather Vito, he moved uh, to the south side uh, from Italy, and they had four more kids, and my grandfather was one of those, Daniel. Okay, well, what was it like growing up? Some of the memories I have from the south side, in a very small little community that we were in. My parents had a very, very small house. I think they said it cost Nineteen thousand dollars to buy the house that uh, that I was born in and lived in a, as a kid, and I went to a, a elementary school there uh, called Sandburg. I remember that, and one of the events that I remember very well is that's where uh, I was when John Kennedy was was shot, and I remember that day. I have pictures in my mind of that day of go, going to school, and. Uh, having them send everybody home uh, because the president had been shot that day. Uh, that was when I was in third grade. And then fourth grade, we moved from the south side to the north side of Chicago. I read that you, you had quite the um, growing up as a teenager. <laughs> well, 
I was, uh, you know, when you when you move. So like, we moved a little bit when I was a kid. So we moved when I was about. I think I was about nine years old. Started fourth grade. We moved from the south side. I was in a little town called Harvey, Illinois, and then we moved up to Highland Park, Illinois, which is about 25 miles north of the city of Chicago. I lived there, I lived in Highland Park till I was about seventh grade or so. Um, about midway through seventh grade, we moved out to another suburb called Glen Ellen, and I lived in Glen Ellen till I was about, till the end of my freshman year. Then, then we decided, my parents decided to move back to Highland Park. So I was kind of jostled around a little bit there, and, and by the time I got to a sophomore year in high school, uh, I was playing in bands as a kid and that kind of thing, but academically I was not doing well at all. And the moving was kind of disruptive, you know, when you take teenagers, you know, out of their environment, plop them down with a bunch of kids they don't know. Even though we moved back to Highland Park where I'd lived, a lot of the kids I knew uh, previously, before we moved to Glen Ellen, they, they had moved on and I wasn't really friends with them anymore. So I remember kind of struggling to find my, my niche in high school and I was playing in bands and I just, uh, at the end of my sophomore year, toward the end of my sophomore year, I stumbled in to the theater community, the theater department, the theater department kids and ended up in a play, West Side Story. And that's how I started acting when I was 16 years old. And I just, you know, as a struggling kid, having a lot of trouble in school. But when I hit the acting thing and found this play group and started performing on stage, I just fell in love with it. I, I that's all I wanted to do and I was, Struggling academically, I was not doing well at all, but all of a sudden I was taking the theater classes and I was getting great grades in all the theater classes I was taking. So I, I just found this thing that I was doing. So I was playing music as a kid and I was acting in plays and I finally made it through high school. <laughs> well, I love your story and we're gonna talk about her when we come back, Mrs. Patterson, and how one person took a hold of you and turned your life around and said that you, know, you had something special and we're gonna talk about it when we come back. Gary, I love when you tell the story about the teacher, Mrs. Patterson. You were struggling. She took a hold of you, and she said, "You know what? You have something special." Tell me about her. Yeah, that that was a that was a life changing moment, really. Uh, as I said, I was playing in bands in school, and I was struggling as a kid and not doing well academically, and I mean, really poorly academically. And I I, I was having trouble uh, adjusting and finding my thing. All I wanted to do was play music and I, I was failing a lot of classes and just not doing well at all. And I think, uh, I think I was actually skipping a class and just hanging out in this hallway one day, uh, kind of later in the sophomore year, probably spring of sophomore year and hanging out with my band members in the hallway. And I remember this little lady walking down the hall and just turning around and saying, I'm directing West Side Story. I'm the theater teacher, you know, I think. And I'm directing West Side Story and you look perfect for the gang members. Come and audition for the play. And then she blew off down the hall and we just looked at each other and laughed, you know. No, nobody really took it seriously, but I thought, hmm. I'm gonna go check this out. So after school was the audition and I went and I saw all these pretty girls going in there into the audition. So I followed them in and I didn't know what to do. You know, I had no idea what an audition was or anything like that, but they handed me a script and said, read this part and uh, told me to get up there. And so I'm like <laughs> stumbling through. And I really wasn't taking it seriously at all. I was just goofing off. And I thought, and the kids were laughing at me. So I just goofed off a little more and then they laughed a little more and I 
I thought, well, this is fun. And uh, I looked up at one point and the teacher was laughing. She was, she was kind of getting a kick out of it. And so the following morning, you know, uh, I don't know, were you ever in a play at, no, in school? No. So you audition for the play and then everybody shows up to see if you're on the list and you, if you got cast. The cast list is posted on the board and everybody's crowding around. And I remember getting there and there was a big crowd around, everybody looking to see if they'd made it. And I looked for my name and there was my name uh, to play this little part in West Side Story. So I got in the play and she gave, she gave me a little part. And I just fell in love with acting and fell in love. She was wonderful. She was unlike any teacher I ever knew because she really talked to the kids like they could, they could really have a good time. And she was funny and she was also an actress. So she was performing, you know, constantly for the kids. And it was fun. It was unlike any teacher I ever had. And I just loved her. And I loved being in the play. I remember closing night for the play. I just burst into tears. I was so sad. It was over. But then the following year, I went back in the first play that they were going to do. I went and tried to get in it. Ended up not getting in the play, but I, wore, I, I raised my hand and volunteered to be on the stage crew. And then the next play I auditioned for, I got a big part in it, and then I got another big part, and then I got another big part. And it just took off from there. I became one of the top theater kids for the rest of my schooling. And when it came to, I was, this was 1973 when I was supposed to graduate. I had done a ton of plays and in fact, as I mentioned, so many of my classes I wasn't doing well in, but the teachers actually would see that they, they would come and see me in the, these plays and they could see that I was like on fire on stage and doing really great. So they would, they would find ways to grade me for what I was doing in the theater part, the department to give me a better grade in their social studies class or whatever. They would tell me to talk about the play and then I would and they'd give me a grade for it. So they were really trying to help me because they saw that this failing kid was now excelling in something really positive. But when it came to time to graduate, because I had been so bad with so many of my classes, I didn't have enough credits to graduate. So I had to go back for an extra semester. So my class graduated, they all went off to college, they did their thing, and I had to go back to high school. So I felt, even though I knew kids from the theater department that were in the class that was coming up, that I was now gonna be a part of, um, still I felt, I felt kind of like a f bit of a failure. But the first play that came up, I auditioned for it, I got a big part in it, and it made that extra semester worth <laughs> worth going back for because it, it was a really good show and and I got a really good, you know, got a lot out of it. And that sent me on my way into the acting world. Now, were you a believer at this time? Were you church going family or? No, no, no. No, no my, my uh, you know, I, I was baptized in a little Christian church when I was, you know, little uh, on the South side but then my parents really stopped going to, uh, to church. My, my grandfather and grandmother, my grandfather was very uh, Italian. He was 100% Italian. And he married my grandmother who was not Italian. He was Catholic, she was Methodist or something like that. And so they really, I don't know, their, their parents were mad at him <laughs> and that's something. And they stopped going, so my, my, my mom and dad you know, it really didn't bring me up with with anything. I remember going to Sunday school a little bit as a kid, but no, it was later in life that um, I found my faith and um, all, all the way through high school and all of that, and there, there was not, nothing. Well, you made some really sweet friends in high school that took you from the high school and then you started something incredible. When I read it, I thought, oh, I can't believe he started that. After you graduated, what happened? So going to college, I just, I, I thought about trying to get into a theater school, but then I, I just, the idea of going to college uh, wasn't appealing to me. So I um, started a little theater company right out of high school. 
and uh, we called it Steppenwolf Theater. And I got together with some of the kids that were still in high school, and we found a space, and we started doing plays and it was in there. In a, was it in a church? You started? Well, originally it was in this little Unitarian church that my, my parents knew the architect who had designed the church. And I said, could we, do you think they'd let us use that to put on a play? And they gave us a key and said, go ahead. So we'd go in there at night and rehearse our play, and we did our first play in the Unitarian Church 50 years ago wow. in 1974. And it's still going, isn't it? Steppenwolf is now a, it's a Chicago institution. It's a gigantic uh, multi-theater complex on the north side of Chicago. It started with little kids, no money, nothing, and it's, it's an institution now. Uh, very well regarded all, all around the world. A lot of great actors have come out of there over the years. Take me back to those days when you were just starting and, and some of the stories that happened there. I go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, you, you know, Like I said, I didn't want to go to college, but I wanted to keep doing the, the, the plays. And I loved the kids that I was doing plays with and everything. We just found a space. We found this Unitarian church. We start, We picked a play and we went in there and started doing it. Then we did another one. Remember the, the musical Grease? Oh yeah. Yeah, so that was the second one and I directed it, I was in it and I produced it with about a thousand bucks of money that I had earned working for my dad. And then we did another play in there and then we found, uh, we that was 74 and then in 76, my buddies who had kind of worked with me, they had gone off to college at Illinois State University. And that's where they met John Malkovich and Laurie Metcalf and Joan Allen, all these great people. And so we put a small theater company together. It was still called Steppenwolf. And I found an, an empty basement of a closed down Catholic school that was perfect to build a small theater in. So in the summer of 1976, they finished college. They came up from Illinois State. It was downstate. They came up to Highland Park and we went into the basement of the Catholic school and we started doing plays in there in 1976. And not for any money, nobody got paid anything. We were all working other jobs. We just do our theater at night, go work our day jobs, then do the theater at night. And if you go to Chicago now and you see that and you see the gigantic complex, the seeds were planted years ago by a bunch of kids. And it really is a great American, just the great American dream story of starting with a passionate idea, working hard and building it into something special. It has to make you feel just amazing when you see it that you know, you started it and now look at it today. Yeah, it's, it's something. I mean, a lot of people have come and gone throughout the years. You know, it's 50 years that it's been around now. So we've had different boards of directors come, come and go. And the boards have been really, you know, uh, a big, big part of it because they helped us raise the money to build the buildings and do all the different things while the artists were working their, their magic on stage. Now, how did that take you from Chicago, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, take you to Hollywood, because it's a fascinating story and we're gonna talk about it when we come back. <music> Gary, from Steppenwolf to Hollywood, how did that all happen? <laughs> An interesting story. I mean, we started doing plays in the basement and we were kind of isolated in, in this Catholic school basement in the suburb of Highland Park, 25 miles north of Chicago. But we started getting reviewed by Chicago critics who started hearing about this, these kids up in this basement doing this rock and roll theater. It was great. So Chicago critics would start driving from Chicago all the way up to this basement to see what was going on with these theater kids. And we were doing a lot of great stuff in there. And we eventually, eventually we moved into the city of Chicago. And that's where we started doing uh, some, some plays that we would move to New York. I remember the first play we moved to New York was 
called True West by Sam Shepard. John Malkovich and I were in it, and we moved it in 1982. It was the first time we went to New York with a play. Nobody in New York knew who we were, really. But it got great reviews, and it was a gigantic hit. And it, it was the play that really launched Malkovich's career. He went off and started doing movies after that. That was a very, very popular play. And then from that point on, we like 1983, we took another play there. 1984, we took another play there. They were all hits. They were all big hits. 1985, I did a play called Orphans. Wonderful play. And it was a big, big hit. Did really well. And I got offered uh, a directing deal with Columbia Pictures at that point. I said, well, you know, I'm the artistic director of, uh, of Steppenwolf. I'm, I think it's time to step out and do something else. So I took the deal and moved to California and started and directed my first movie. It wasn't for Columbia, but Columbia gave me an office. They gave me an assistant, and I had a two-year deal there to direct movies. I found a script that happened to be with a small company called Cinecom, and it was a movie that was released called Miles From Home, with Richard, ended up being with Richard Gere. And that was the first movie I directed. Shot it in 1987. Um, it wasn't a big hit or anything, didn't, didn't do that well, but it got some people's attention. And when I was done with that, I, we went into another Steppenwolf production of The Grapes of Wrath. And I played Tom Joad, uh, the, if you remember the movie, uh, Henry Fonda played that part in the movie. Uh, we moved, eventually moved it to Broadway. It won the Tony Award. It was a big, big hit. And after, it won, after we closed in 1990, I was now living in Los Angeles because I moved out to Los Angeles and I got my first real part in a movie, uh, which was a movie called A Midnight Clear. It was a World War, World War II movie. And so 1991, I did my first movie and that came out. It did, it did pretty well as a small film. Um, but I also had acquired the rights to make Of Mice and Men into a movie. When we were working on The Grapes of Wrath, I got very close with Elaine Steinbeck, who was John Steinbeck's widow, and she controlled the rights to all his, his books. And I asked her, would you give me the rights to Of Mice and Men? And she gave me the rights to Of Mice and Men, and I ended up making a movie of that. And that caught Hollywood's attention because I produced it, directed it, and was in it with John Malkovich. We had actually done the play on stage in 1980, 81. And so it was natural for me to ask John if he wanted to do it. Here it is. It came out in 1992, and uh, things started to take off from there. When did you get the role that everybody talks about, you know, even today? Well, I think the, the producers of Forrest Gump saw Of Mice and Men and they invited me to come in and audition for Lieutenant Dan. I did and got lucky to get the part. Uh, we started shooting in 1993 and the movie came out in 1994, 30 years ago. 30 years ago this month, actually. <laughs> and it's still one of the favorites of all times. I've watched Apollo 13. That was a great movie, too. <laughs> Thank you. And, of course, Ransom. That was a great one. I, I read that you weren't too sure about Ransom because it, you were the villain, but you said you had fun with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our kids were young when I read that, and, you know, my career was, was changing. Of Mice and Men, Forrest Gump, those things, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things happened right around in there. And so the career was kind of on the, uh, it was ascending at, the, at that point. So I started to get offered some good things. I got offered, uh, I got, Ron Howard did Apollo 13. Uh, you know, it was great to work with Tom again, Tom Hanks. And then Ron's next movie after Apollo 13 was going to be Ransom. My kids were little 
And I don't know if you know, you know, I mean, you've, you've seen Ransom. He, he's a he's a pretty bad guy <laughs> in it, and I didn't I didn't like him when I read it. I didn't really want to play the part of a guy who kidnaps some, somebody's yeah. kids because my kids were little. Lieutenant Dan has touched the lives of millions of veterans, and did you have any idea that that would just touch them? Well, when we were, when we were shooting, um, we. We were having a great time making the movie, uh, for sure. So we we knew it felt good, but you never quite know how it's all going to end up. And in fact, you know, it was very difficult for some of us to actually know what was going on in the film because it's all these separate little stories, right? Like, I I never really worked with Sally Field. One one scene, <clears throat> one little scene with Sally and Robin Wright. But the rest of the time, they were off doing the, you know, doing their shooting, shooting all their scenes. We didn't really know what they were doing. So I didn't, I had no clue until I saw the movie. It was very hard to kind of picture how the movie was gonna end up because I really didn't know what everybody was doing in the film. But when we saw it the first time, everybody, I, I've told a story about the uh, image that I remember sitting there in the theater. Just a small little theater. They wanted to show the cast and some of the people that worked on it before it premiered. And the lights came up and everybody, and Robin Wright was with Sean Penn at the time. And so they were sitting down here and they stood up and turned around and I was sitting back there and they both looked at me. I remember locking eyes with them and they both had big smiles on their faces because we all knew it was really good and it was a really good movie and then of course it opened about a week later and they you know it, it was off to the races at that point it, the, the movie did so well and 30 years later it's still kind of very present in people's minds Thank you for watching this week. Stay tuned for next week because Gary has a lot more to share with his life story. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.